My next question is, um, what advice would you give to anyone looking to write, draw and self-publish their own comic? Well, I, I, I really can't say these days. I mean, um, as you'll know from reading the individual issues, I was, um, I was a great proponent of self-publishing back in the day. And um, I made a success of it and wanted to pass my experience on how I made a success to other people. Um, you know, that was 20 years ago or more. Yeah. And the industry changed hugely since then. Yeah. And I'm really not qualified to give advice to people um, on a you know nuts and bolts level about um, self-publishing these days because you've got things. I mean, uh, web comics were just about starting back then um the distribution process has, has changed it's much more difficult to actually get um distributed and into diamond previews and that kind of thing now um there's kickstarter now i haven't done a kickstarter so i can't give anyone advice on kickstarters or anything like that so i'm probably you know not the not the right person to to ask about that but um in general terms, I'd say um, do something you're passionate about because if it's a success and you end up doing it for 25 years like me, you want it to be something you're passionate about. Um, it's going to potentially suck all your free time, all your savings, all your money. Um, so you've got to be completely committed if, if, that's, what you, if that's what you really want to do. Um, and I think you, you, it's about, for me, it was about sincerity. It was about, I wanted to just produce a comic. I mean, it, I think it's had a lot of, uh, you know, attention from, you know, movie and, and TV people because I wanted it to read like that. I wanted it to appeal to, 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 to those sorts of readers, you know, people that don't read comics, but people that enjoy the drama series on TV. I, want, I, I wanted to try and broaden the, the market for comics back then. Um, and I think if you're going to do your do your own comic series or whatever, then I think you've got to be sincere and do it for the right reasons. You shouldn't be cynical and say try and do it for merchandising or, or for selling the TV rights or, or anything, because I think sincerity comes through in your work. I think people like you for that. Um, And I think, um, I, do, I don't want to use the word network because that sounds, like that actually sounds very cynical, but just make friends, just go to co comic conventions, write to people and be proactive on social media, make friends, make connections, because you don't know in two years, five years, 10 years, where those people are going to be. Yeah. Uh, you know, just, just, just be nice, be visible, be accessible. Um, you know, it's worked for me to an extent, you know, um, so, um, uh, no, I think probably, that sounds that's like, probably the best I can give yeah. At the yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a very honest answer. You know, technology's changed a lot as well since 1995. So production of comics and how you can get to market, very different. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, but, you know, back in my day, it was all about trying to produce it as, as cheaply as possible. I mean, I used to, you know, I create, I create in the UK and in those days I printed in Canada for distribution to North America because that's where the biggest market for comics is. Um, I used to physically send the artwork over to Canada and then they used to physically send it back, you know, and, and, and scan it and uh, you, you'd print up thousands and thousands of copies to get the to you know to get the price per issue down yeah you know whereas whereas these days when you're when you're self self-publishing selling conventions and things you're you're not you're not looking selling thousands you're looking selling hundreds maybe um and you with digital printing you haven't got that um 
the more you print, the cheaper they get, kind of thing. They, 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 they tend to, you know, you, a little bit, but um, it, it, it's really hard to make money at that. But then again, you can produce these beautiful f- full color, yeah, copy comics and have them die cut or you know, silver ink or whatever, you know, and, and, and print twenty copies up. And it's it's kind of mind blowing for me. But when I was when I was at art <laughs> college, or I was, you know, uh, the the, the the local printer got a, a colour photocopier in and it just kind of blew my mind, you know, that you could actually produce, you know, get a reproduction of your stuff in colour. I mean, it cost an arm and a leg. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so, so it, it's, it's kind of pros and cons these days, really. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I went to uh, the London MCM convention a couple of weeks ago and um, I met a guy there who was exactly doing what you said he was he, he, he's a he's a he's a writer but what he does he commissions artists to draw his work and then he puts together and self-publishes um, his own comic called london horror comic um, uh, yeah um really beautiful you know and great artwork glossy color you know really high production standards um you know, and I think he's doing exactly what you said. He's getting out there. He's, you know, he's going and meeting people, and you know, um, and, and and good on him. I think he's up to issue about nine, so you know, he's doing all right. Good, yeah. Right. Good to see. Um, okay, I think I might know the answer to this question because we've already discussed <laughs> partly on this. But who is your favourite writer of comics, and who's your favourite comic artist? Um. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, like you, I mean, uh, I've been, I've been a reader and collector of comics all my life. Um, there's just so many. I mean, uh, I wouldn't know where to start. I've I've always been more interested in, uh, I wouldn't say more interested in the art side of it, but I've always been more of a follower of artists than I have of writers. Okay. Uh, now, I'm presumably you're, you're referring to Alan Moore. Yeah. Um, in the mid '80s, if you were a fan of comics, you were a fan of Alan Moore because yeah. Alan was everywhere. Yeah. In the mid '80s, and he was reviewing fanzines in British Marvels and wow. yeah, writing Captain Britain and doing V and Marvel Man for for Warrior and then Swamp Thing and, and it, I mean it was just it was just an amazing time and it, it's a bit like you know being in the '60s and being asked if you like the Beatles, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's almost compulsory, you know. Yeah. I mean, if you're into comics, uh, especially at that time, you had to be into Alan Moore, you know. Yeah. He, he was the industry, so it's, it's, it it seems it it seemed weird to me to say he's my favourite writer. Um, I'd say he is, but um, yeah, I mean, it'd be, it'd be It'd be ludicrous to, to say any, to say anyone else, but I've, I've kind of followed. I mean, I do follow creative teams. I I, I, I like um, writer artists in particular, like myself. People that do both things. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so so I mean, writer artists like. Um, I was a big fan of the drawn and quarterly fantagraphics oh, yeah. kind of yeah. uh, kind of movement, um, you know, in the eighties and nineties. So you know, you're talking about Dan Cooper and Dan Dan Clowes, Chester Brown, um, you know, all those kinds of people. Um, Chris Ware. Um, I mean, I wrote a book called Comic Book Design. Okay. We, um, that was for Isle Express, who did the Animal Storyteller book. And there are, I mean, literally hundreds of examples from our collection in there from 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 artists that, that I like. Um, Bill Sienkiewicz, Judge Williams, um, Dave McKean, all that kind of barren story school of kind of... Um, realism but with a kind of like a um almost like a 70s movie poster art kind of elements to it um 
you know, I love the French artists. Uh, I was, you know, heavy metal at the time in, in, in the eighties. Again, blew my mind. Um, Mobius and and Drew Lay and and Kaza, all those kinds of artists. Um, classic artists like um, uh, Barry Windsor Smith, Steranko, um, Wally Wood, Bernie Wrightson. Um, uh, but you know, also you know, cartoony stuff. You know, um, uh, Bill Watson's Calvin and Hobbes is just, just, it's just the best. It's just pure comics, it's just fantastic. Will Eisner, of course. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. You want me to pick one? I don't know. It Dave McKay. Who? Dave McKay. It'll be a different answer tomorrow. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. No. Uh, Dave's. Dave's so versatile and he's so prolific and um, I could say that probably be a, a, you know a lot of the artists um, actually my favorite artist at the moment is uh, a French artist called Nicolas de Crecy. oh okay I don't know he, I'll look he, he he's um, he did uh, not all of his stuff's been translated to, into English, but a, a few things have. And one of them is called The Celestial Bibendum, mm -hmm. which came out through Knock About about 10 years ago or so. Um, his stuff is just beautiful. I think if I wanted to draw like anybody, it'd probably be like him. Okay, right. Well, I'll go and check him out. So I don't know, don't know him. Great. Um, do, you, do you read any current comics? And if so, what? Yes, I'm. As I say, I'm. I'm a. I'm a lifelong comics reader, fan, collector, um, and um, uh, back in the back in the mid eighties, I actually had a comic shop. Oh, did you? And okay. um, yeah, for a couple of years. And um, I mean, I think every month since then. I've read previews, done previews, cover to cover. Right. So just trying to keep abreast of, of you know, uh, what the different companies are doing and keeping me on, uh, on new creators and stuff. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've got wide tastes. Uh, I, I find it difficult to keep up with um, what Marvel and DC are doing a lot of the time because... Comics are so expensive now. You, 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 you know. I mean, I, I read a lot. I buy more. I want to buy more. You know, and it's just it's just impossible to to keep up with it all. And when uh, when Marvel and DC do these company crossovers and um, sorry, not company crossovers, but the, the you know the, the yeah. events titles, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it, it's hard to. It's hard to follow any kind of individual series without being aware of everything else that's going on, which was, you know, fine in the 60s or whatever when there was 20 titles, but now there's, you know, I don't know, 100 or whatever coming out a month. It's, it's you know, and at the price size, it's, it's just too much to keep up with. My, my one comic that I do I've always stick with is Fantastic Four. So that's oh. always been my, my favourite. Yeah, yeah uh, me too. Of um, uh, an interesting thing about Fantastic Four, uh, number one came out um, the month after I was born. So I like to think that Jack Kirby was actually drawing it when yeah. I was born. So, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I kind of do have a, 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 a real uh, affection for, for the Fantastic Four. Do you have but, a Fantastic uh, Four number one? Sorry? Do you have a Fantastic Four number one? No. No. <laughs> Me either. No, that's, that's a holy grail. No, that's, <laughs> uh, no I, I, I come pretty close to buying one for £95, a, a, a comic oh. a long time ago. <sighs> um, but uh, it would have been the first time I ever used a credit card. But I thought, oh, I don't know, I was a bit nervous about using a credit card for that amount of money. And it's a, it's a shame, really, because I could probably pay the rest of my mortgage off. Yeah, you probably would be able to, yeah. Do you know the English publisher, Alan Class? Yes. Who did the uh, re reprints? So he tells a great story of um, 
So he is he, the guy who he de- dealt with said to him, look, there's this new new series coming out called Fantastic Four. Are you interested in adding them to your portfolio? So he said, yes. And um, the guy said, well, look, I've got a copy here. And so he gave him a copy of Fantastic Four number one. So Alan went back to his office, sat, sat in his office a month or so later, he was going to be producing his version of the Fantastic Four number one. And the printer came to see him. And his printer said to him, Alan, I'm going to be printing, um, you know, Creepy Worlds, whatever it is, 32 next week with the Fantastic Four. Have you got anything I could use as reference colour? So he ripped the cover off his Fantastic <laughs> Four, gave it to the printer and threw the rest in the bin. And, and then yeah. Alan tells it, he says, I don't want to talk about it anymore. It hurts too <laughs> much. Because, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. a million... I'm going to do that, I'm going to, do that to a comic. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so current comics, um, as I say, I tend to follow creator or, you know, creators or creative teams. And my favourite is uh, Brubaker and Phillips. Um, they're, um, you know, they've been doing Criminal recently and I loved Fatal and Kill or Be Killed, I loved. And they're doing the, the, their latest series as... Um, Hardcover graphic novels, and um, I haven't actually read any of those yet. Uh, Reckless. Yeah. Um, so the the kind of hard boiled crime stuff, you know. I mean, uh, that's always been an attraction. Um, it's not being published at the moment, but David Lapham's Stray Bullets who was a huge oh, yeah. favourite. Yeah. Um, he was uh, he was self publishing that around the same time as I, as I was starting to self publish as well. Um, I think that is just such a great read, you know. Um, yeah, and having said I don't follow writers, um, there's been, you know, there's been a, a couple of interesting writers recently. Uh, James Tynion. Yeah, I love him. Who yeah. did? Um, uh, I mean, I like I like what he did on Batman, um, and I've got the. Something is killing the children. Not not the first issue, but I, I, I've got a reprint of that, and you know uh, that didn't really grab me. But um, Department of Truth that he does, and um, uh, the Nice House on the Lake, I think is fabulous. So uh, he's uh, he, he's one to watch. Um, Tom King, again, he did some interesting things with Batman, but then he he. He started doing these really kind of formulaic, um, uh, what's almost like a formalism uh, uh, in recreating like Mr. Miracle and the Vision in these 12 issue story arcs, um, Strange Adventures. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of like, you know, what, what he's doing with that. Um, just got the first issue of his Human Target, which looks very interesting. Um, Echo Lands, I don't know if you've seen Echo yeah, Lands. But I've got it, yeah, I'm collecting that. I'm, I'm buying that one, yeah. With, yeah, that's, I mean, Jim Williams' artwork is just yeah, yeah. unbelievable on that. The, the stuff he's posting on Instagram is just blowing my mind, really. Um, not sure about the subject matter in Entirely, but there's something called Red Room by Ed Piscor that's coming out. Yeah, from of- I've, it's a bit, it's a bit too gory for me. I've got, I did buy yeah. the first two or three issues, but it's just too much for me. I've, I've only read the first one. I'm, 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 I find it really intriguing. I mean, it, it's a real, um, it's a real video nasty of a comic, but yeah. I, I like his approach to the to the packaging and uh, the marketing, and uh, you know, I, I really like the way he's doing it. But I'm not sure I can really stick with this. <laughs> it's, it's kind of stomach journey, I, I admit. Um, he does a great, he's got a great YouTube channel as well. Does some great reviews on. Um... Yeah, yeah. I don't really get a whole lot of time to watch YouTube. Uh, there's uh, when when I'm doing something like inking or or, or coloring. Sometimes I have the YouTube channels on, but quite often I find them too distracting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's um, I, uh, I am aware. I've seen one or two of his uh, of his YouTube things. Um, yeah, a couple of other creators. Uh, Maria Lovett, 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Eros. Yeah. Um, some... yeah. Sorry? Eros Psyche. And um, yeah, I like her stuff. He did. Uh, well, she's. Um, well, the, uh, there's different companies publishing like some of her older stuff as well as her newer stuff because she did that that kind of erotic series with um, Brian Azzarello, um, Faithless. Um, that's interesting, but I kind of like her earlier, more manga type stuff that's being reprinted now. The um, Heartbeat and Porcelain. Porcelain. Uh, this that's really good and um i really like everything scotty young does as well um he did um he wrote and drew um i love fairyland yes yeah um which it's just uh, it's just fantastic absolutely love that but then he went on to do middle west and he's doing a comic called um the me you love in the dark now yeah, yeah. um but he's he's got a guy called um george corona drawing that and i mean yeah yeah, yeah. and then um graphic novels i'm so behind in my reading you know i mean I, I tend to try and get the comics out of the way but there doesn't seem to be any time to, to 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 read the graphic novels um one i i really did enjoy recently was uh called the book tour by andy watson which came out through top shelf i don't know that one um just oh okay oh i've seen the cover yeah yeah so it's a kind of kafka-esque story uh -huh. about the going on a book tour and nobody turning up and it it really <laughs> it rings quite true <laughs> uh, and uh but there, there, there's 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 another level to it and i, I I really want to read it again just to see if I'm right, but um, uh, really did enjoy that. Um, and I think it's Magnetic Press or somebody putting uh, a reissue in the, the Sergio Toppy books at the moment. Um, there's, you know, there's just just so much good stuff coming out at the moment. It's, I think we've we've hit a real golden patch for comics at the moment. Absolutely. I don't know if you've read any stuff by Ram V. Um, oh, absolutely, yeah. The Many Deaths of Lila Starr, I thought was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just finished it. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, no, he's... He, um, I'm very jealous. Yeah, I mean, you know, and he says his inspiration is Alan Moore. You know, he says his favourite, uh, you know, he's, and you can tell there's a definite Alan Moore influence there. Um Yes, first time I've ever seen a comic written in the point of view of a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I like his stuff. Um, right, if you could try time travel back to 1995, what advice would you give the young Gary? Yeah. Um, well, um, I'd say buy as many Silver Age comics as you possibly <laughs> Yeah. Start. Spend that ninety-five pounds on the Fantastic Four number one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'm not so young. Now. Uh, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't so young when I started Strange Haven. Uh, I was already in my mid thirties. Yeah. So, um, I'd, I'd actually had, I'd actually already had um, a lot of life experience by then. Um, as I say, my own comic shop, I'd been to art school, um, you know, I'd, I'd done fanzines. Um, I had a pretty clear of what I wanted to do. Um, that there's probably a few technical things that um, uh, maybe not make my Masonic Society look so much like the Klu Klux Klan yeah. because I... Um, I mean, that wasn't actually deliberate. I mean, they were actually based on the uh, Samana Santa, which is the, uh, I don't know, if you, you know, like, you know, in, 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 in Spain and, you know, other Catholic yeah. countries, they have these Easter parades and, you know, they kind of dress up like that. And I lived in Spain for four years and it was, uh, you know, it, I wanted to try and capture some of that that kind of uh, 
atmosphere. Um, and um, there's also some, some Doctor Strange villains called the Sons of Satanish. Yeah. Uh, it was episodes. It was Gene, Gene Cullen, yeah. uh, Jordan Story. And um, so I, I had a kind of, I, I wasn't consciously thinking about, you know, Klu Klux Klan when I, when I put those on, but I can see why, um, you know, it's, it's not entirely inaccurate, but. Um, you know, maybe I would have gone with something more like different animal masks or something like that. Now, um, but um, no, I mean, j j just small technical things like that. Um, maybe I should have been more realistic about how much I could produce. Um, I had visions of doing a monthly comic back then, you know, rather than an annual comic. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, originally, I was going to draw it in a in a kind of abbreviated style and not use photo reference because I, I I'd been inspired by Ted McKeever back then. I don't know if you know his stuff. Know from, his stuff yeah. from, uh, and uh, Keith Giffen did a an uh, ambush bug miniseries for DC, which was nine panel grid, lots of repeated sort of photocopied panels, and again very quite roughly drawn, and. Um, that was my initial idea and, and maybe I should have stuck with that. But like I said earlier, maybe part of Strange Haven's success is the fact that it's kind of meticulously drawn photo reference stuff. Yeah. So um, I, maybe that's something I shouldn't give myself advice on. Um, yeah, maybe I should, I should say, focus on producing more content rather than um, trying to give value for money so much, you know, because as I said, uh, uh, a lot of my efforts were in, uh, you know, to try and produce something really beautiful, but a, re a price that nobody could turn down almost, you know. Um, whereas I think there was, there's a lot of other people in the industry which were more focused on getting comics out on a regular basis and, and not worrying so much about the packaging and, and the, the other paraphernalia around it. But well, that's a natural tendency of mine. So again, it's probably advice that I would, would have ignored. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. And, um, uh, what, what I'd say is I, I'd, I'd want to go back further than that. I'd want to go back to, to, to my teens or maybe my okay. college day and just okay. tell me, tell myself to say, um, keep drawing draw every day you know don't get distracted just um yeah because i have to say one of the one of the other things i like about looking at your work is how the how your art progresses you know it, it, in my view it gets better <laughs> over time Thank you. It, you know, i mean the quality that you're producing at the moment that i've seen on your website i mean it's you know it's it's a mile away from strange haven issue one um really thank you and it's nice to hear you say that because you know as some people were saying about especially about the color stuff with meanwhile is that oh I don't put so much detail in it and all the rest of it but I, I have tried to kind of I think I just get bored if I use the same technique so I, I'm always trying to develop new techniques and ostensibly it's to to make things quicker for me but it never does it always seems to take four days to draw a page no matter how I kind of approach it but I've gone through yeah I mean from the first volume it was the traditional um uh traditional Bristol board pencils inks um and then I went through a, a digital phase where I was well before the term was even invented I was um I was inking digitally by turning my pencil art into into black line just just through scanning um then i was using ink washes on watercolor board yeah uh, and at the moment i'm doing everything digitally and, uh, and doing it in color you know and and um in future it'll probably be kind of a mixture because I, you know i do miss working with you know real real materials yeah 
yeah. um, it's so difficult to get the good materials now. It's so difficult to get a brush that holds a point and that kind of stuff these days. So digital is, you know, very seductive. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think just to keep myself interested, I have to, I have to keep playing with my techniques, modifying the techniques, and and it's very nice of you to say that that you know you're liking me newer stuff. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, very much so. And so I know that you used to sell original artwork, but um, I haven't seen any for sale on your website. No. Do you still sell original artwork or not? I, I, um, I've i sold a lot of the, you know, my, my a lot of the good pages. I sold a lot of covers and I kind of regret that now. Yeah. I mean, at the time it was a means to an end because I say, I mean, it was... Um, I was trying to make a full-time living yeah. and the art was sitting there in a stack. Um, but I think since going digital, um, I'm not producing any new artwork. No. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why there's been such an explosion in prices of, of you know, the, the old original artwork now. And, you know, looking back, I've really undersold yeah. a lot of my art. So, um, I'm not sure at one point maybe yeah uh, i'm sure i will sell some pages again um but at the moment i've got so much else going on um that i'm uh i've just, I've just put a moratorium on that for the moment yeah fair enough i can understand that but you know our original artwork prices have gone crazy if you've got an original frank frazetta somewhere in your attic um absolutely get it out <laughs> Yeah, I remember. Uh, the, I think it's the first Diego I went to. There was there was some guy with a huge stack of Jack Kirby pages that he was oh. selling like fifty dollars each or something. Yes, <laughs> crazy. Uh, but, he, has the comic inst- industry different to how it was in '95? And what's better and what's worse? Yeah. Okay. Um, because that's a really good question. Um, uh yeah i mean you were saying that there's so much good stuff around and i mean there really is and i think that's the the best of it that, that there's you know what image you're doing at the moment just giving creative freedom to so many you know talented people i, I think that's uh, you know that, that's one of the best things and it's it's really difficult to to keep up with that that volume of quality stuff um so I think the art form is in much better shape now. Um, I think comics have got a respect now that I didn't have before. It was a, it was something I was striving to, to do, to, to try and get comics to a mainstream audience by, as I said, but by using a, a, a simple nine panel grid, um, kind of familiar kind of dramatic format, um, just trying to make it easy for people to read and try, trying to reach those people. Whereas I think the Marvel films have kind of done that to an extent. Um, geek culture, you know, uh, uh, and just uh, people of a certain age now being in in control of of some aspects of the media. Yeah. Um, you, so, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I posted um, a picture on Instagram of a bookshop in a place uh, a few miles from here called Chelmsford. Um, it was a uh, Foyles bookshop in Chelmsford upstairs and such a fantastic selection of graphic novels and, and manga. I mean, you know, that's something you could only dream of, you know, uh, 25 years ago. And like I said, there's so much classic material being represented, so much foreign material being re, you know printed in english for the first time i mean it's it's just it's just wonderful um i don't want to end on a on a bad note but um yeah what's changed for the worse i mean quite a lot also uh, again i've mentioned it before the high prices of individual comics um, and particularly this trend of um, ratio variant co- variant covers. Um, it, it, it's 
it's this artificially created collectability just by artificially limiting the numbers they print, which are usually just like color variations of the, the same image or the same image without trade dress or smaller trade dress or whatever. And, yeah, you know, they're, they're, it's manufactured scarcity rather than, yeah. rather than genuine scarcity. You know, it's, I don't like it. And, you know, uh, and people are spending, you know, 25, 50, 100 dollars on these comics. Uh, you're old enough, like me, to remember the 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 eighties, where uh, you know the speculator bubble collapsed. Yeah, uh, it seems to be a, a really long-lasting bubble. This, um, but I think that's a bad. I think that's a you know that's a bad thing. The good thing about variant covers is that it it gives artists more work, and there's some, you know, don't get me wrong, some beautiful covers being produced, oh, yeah. but. The, the ratio variant thing, ratio variant variant is, I think that's a really bad, uh, I think that's a very, very bad trend, um, and also along the, the 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 kind of speculation line is is this thing where people are slabbing new comics, and this obsession with nine point eights, and again then they're, they're never going to be worth money because there's so many of them and. It's, it's the stuff that people are throwing away now that's going to be rare in the future, you know, not the stuff that the, the people are, you know, there's going to be so many 9.8s embedded in plastic, which, again, is terrible from an environmental point of view. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I think that and, you know, along with um, the kind of milking of, of popular characters like, like Batman. I mean, I was always a huge Batman fan from yeah, from from you know the, the Adam West TV series onwards, really. Um, and I I keep buying occasionally buying Batman comics, but I can't even keep up with the one regular title now. This is I don't know, it's five dollars now, I think, yeah. and it's yeah. twice a month, yeah. and it crosses over with Detective, and <laughs> you, you can't even afford. To follow all the Batman titles these days, and if you're not buying anything else, it's ridiculous. So, uh, but I mean, that's not a new thing. I mean, that that, that been doing that. It's just it's just got more and more kind of expensive, you know. And you know, after all, they are businesses, which is fair enough. But um, again, it's the uh, oh, it's the speculator market, you know, this the uh, investment into to new comics that, that I, I just. Uh, I think it's a bit of a blight on the on the industry at the moment, but the art form is just uh, just it's just sailing ahead, and, and long long may that continue. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the big change for me. I actually I got out my um, brochure from the UK Comic Art Convention in 1990 the other day, uh -huh. and um, in it they list the people who pre-registered for the convention. I was in there, and I had a look at it. And there were six, I think there were 600 people, names, right. were, and, and there were 15 women. And I suspect yeah. they were only in there because their husbands had, or their boyfriends had dragged them along, you know. And I can remember if you go to a comic convention in 1990, that's about right. About 3% would have been women. And I went to the London Comic MCM convention and 50-50, you know, it's much more uh, inclusive, much more inclusive than it ever was. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I feel embarrassed for not mentioning that myself now because, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've seen the change happen and I really noticed it um, at Thought Bubble. I think Thought Bubble changed changed the game there. Um, uh, I thought I think Ma Manga started introducing, you know, females into the market, but I think that the, the, the market's broadened. You know, it's not just all about male teenage power fantasy stuff now. Um, th th there's so many great titles that males and females can can enjoy, and there's so many you know really good female creators now. Whereas yeah, before yeah. there were novelty, you know, there wasn't um, a single there wasn't a single female creator in the UK no. comic art convention 1990 um, catalogue. Was I'm going up to Thought Bubble this weekend, and 
yeah. at least half of the guests and half of the people showing are uh, female creators, which is great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Gary, for um, agreeing to do this interview. I've really enjoyed that. And Me too. 